our scriptures this morning. The first one comes from Genesis 28, 10 through 19a. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And wait a minute. And, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and you will bring back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his dream and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning. And he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. Our second reading is 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer scriptural, scriptural, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And our final reading is Matthew 16, 13 through 18. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm glad to see you all today. From early childhood and throughout my life, while walking on a mountain trail, through the Ozark woods or along a riverbank, I have found myself picking up a stone that called out to me. I often look at it closely and hold it for a moment. Have you ever noticed children's innate fascination with stones? There's a sense of wonder in the very young about these miracles of nature and an intuitive awareness of some kind of deep connection to them. During our adult years in our relationship to the earth, we have developed a more distant approach to this previously direct, primitive, if you will, experience. When we look down the path, we are usually watching our step to make sure the stones don't trip us up. Now, don't get me wrong, I recommend that highly. If we do interact with a stone in our path, we are more likely to kick it out of the way than to approach it with reverence. Have you ever thought about how these mineral bodies have humbly and unhurriedly carried their silent messages within themselves for billions of years to arrive at this moment in our path? 
is it possible that these stones, seemingly so mute and inert, have something to teach us about our humanity, about the life of the spirit? Our scripture lessons would say that is so. In this morning's passage from Genesis, we find the rather curious image of Jacob resting his head upon a stone as he sleeps. The most dramatic image in this passage is, of course, Jacob's ladder. You know the song, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. We focus on the ladder, which appears in his dream. It connects heaven and earth and angels are seen ascending and descending. But Jacob's silent stone pillow is equally as an important an image, and it's often, un let's see, what do you do, over or under? Overlooked. When Jacob awakens from his dream, he takes the stone, anoints it with oil, sets it as a pillar, declaring, surely God was in this place. He names the stone Bethel, Beth meaning house, and El, meaning God, as in Elohim. He names, the uh, he names the stone, and of course the stone is more for him than a marker. It had become a medium for the spirit, which somehow in its permanence, its ancientness, its stony silence became a dreamy conductor for the spirit of God. When we look ahead into the New Testament, we see other references to stones and their significance. We see Jesus holding up the emblematic importance of stones when he renames Simon. He declares, you are now Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And of course, Peter comes from the Greek Petra, which means a solid and native rock rising up through the earth. And then again, in the book of 1 Peter, the power of the stone is held up in the charge to put the early Christ, put to the early Christian community. They say, like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house. Just being human on this earth in some mysterious way means that we're seekers on a path, and that it's not merely the idyllic final destination we seek. It's the path itself that really matters. Between birth and death, we face, we face life. It's dramas and traumas and mysteries. It's barren deserts and fertile valleys, snow-capped peaks and deep sea torments. It's sirens and muses, beginnings and endings, partings and reunions. Stones have throughout history been used to guide us. They mark our path in simple physical ways, like the trail markers some of us learn to make and read as children in scouts, or church camps when we stacked smaller rocks upon larger rocks to give direction at a junction for those traveling behind us. There is a Disciples Church in Lafayette, Colorado that named itself Cairn Christian Church. Have you seen that? Uh, I, 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 I see Bob's daughter. I thought you were the one that lived in Lafayette, no? Yeah, yeah, it's around the corner from you. Cairn Christian Church. Here they describe why they named it. Our name is unusual. A cairn is a mound or stack of rocks built at the side of a pathway. Cairns are found all over the world. They are a place to rest. They're signs to show the way when the path is confusing or we are lost. They are symbols of balance and harmony. They're markers of holy places where individuals and groups have experienced God's presence and decided to leave a lasting reminder. They're beautiful, spontaneous pieces of art that celebrate the earth. They're built by hands working together over time or sometimes by a single person. They can be very simple or elaborately and, or elaborate. When we see a cairn, we are drawn to add our own stone to the pile. In all of these ways, it is a metaphor for our life together and a reminder that we are always in process we don't claim to have it all figured out, but we do claim to love and honor the journey. Okay, I confess I am a little envious of that wonderful name for a church. Jacob's stone pillow, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, Britain's Stonehenge, the Great Wall of China, the rocks in the Iona Beach, 
of Scotland or the etched gravestone marking the life of someone we have known and loved. These inspire our lives. The material world through its stones holds the spiritual world in powerful ways. The silence of the stones challenges us to face our own silent truth and to connect with it. The permanence of the stones reminds us to seek the things in life which are lasting. The stillness of the stone allows us to witness the deep patience and fortitude of the earth, which will go on beyond our short lives. If we are able to enter into even a rudimentary relationship to a stone in our path, we might be able to receive and accept the gift it modestly offers. There are many notions of what gifts a particular stone brings emotionally, physically, psychically. These are cataloged in elaborate lists in books on rocks and gems, and there may be truth to this, but it is not what I'm talking about here. I'm speaking of our capacity to be aware of the presence of a stone, not grasping at it for its meaning, for what it has to offer our individual life. This is, in a way, veiled egotism. The grasping at stones is just another form of materialism. Our relationship to stones, to the earth itself, must not be acquisitive. If we are to receive any of the gifts of the spirit from nature, it will not be by willful seizing, either intellectually or, material, or materially. It will be through reverent receiving. When we can truly see these mineral elements of the earth, not simply as inert matter, but rather as living beings. Science has taught us that the inert object that we pull out of our lawns or trip over on a path or slip on as we wade in the creek are not so stubbornly inert. The atoms of which each is made are swirling energy, microcosms of energy. We might not realize that we have just discarded or tripped over or slipped upon an entire galaxy of life's energy. This should inspire our awe, not our annoyance. In the symbol of the stone as a house of God put forth in Genesis, we learn that spirituality doesn't belong only to the skies and to the other world, of which we can know little. In the charge to the early Christians to let yourselves be built into a spiritual house by becoming like living stones, we find a spiritual awareness that the stones also live. The earth itself elementally holds profound truth and patiently awaits our attention. The earth patiently awaits our attention and our appreciation. If a stone can symbolize Bethel, a house of God, then the earth itself can hold deep meaning for each of us. If we'll only stand in reverent silence before its wonder, if we will look and listen. So I encourage each of you during this time of trial, as we are battling nature's power to take life through COVID-19 virus, to remember Jacob's reverence for the stone upon which he laid his head. As you walk out the doors of your own Bethel, your own house of God, continue in the spirit of this morning's worship by communing with these quiet beings Pick up a stone in your path, even if it's only at the edge of a sidewalk. Look at its unique contours and colors and give thanks. Hold a larger stone in both your hands and feel its powerful density and weight. Find a good sized boulder if you can and sit upon it or lean against it and sense its ancient, patient, comforting strength. Rest in the rightness of God's creation. Replenish and recharge your spirit. Reconnect to the earth from which you came and will return. I'll close today with a poem I've read before. Mm -hmm. It's about the living nature of stones. I read this poem at memorial services for two beloved men in our congregation, both of whom were geologists. 
The poem was written by Charles Simic, and it's entitled simply Stone. Go inside a stone, that would be my way. Let somebody else become a dove or gnash with a tiger's tooth. I'm happy to be a stone. From the outside, the stone is a riddle. No one knows how to answer it. Yet within, it must be cool and quiet. Even though a cow steps on it, full weight. Even though a child throws it in the river, the stone sinks slow, unperturbed, to the river bottom where the fishes come to knock on it and listen. I have seen sparks fly out when two stones are rubbed. So perhaps it is not dark inside after all. Perhaps there is a moon shining from somewhere as though behind a hill, just enough light to make out the strange writings, the star charts on the inner walls. Mm -hmm. Amen.